This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 30. Coming up on Space Time. More confirmation of methane spikes on Mars. America to be back on the moon within five years. And what the Saturnian moon Titan can tell us about the origins of life. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A reanalysis of data collected by the European Space Agency's Mars Express Orbiter has corroborated the detection of methane on the red planet's surface, monitored by NASA's Curiosity rover. The confirmation, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, is the first time an in-situ measurement has been independently confirmed from orbit. Ongoing reports of methane detected in the Martian atmosphere have been intensely debated, with Mars Express contributing one of the first measurements from orbit back in 2004, shortly after its arrival at the Red Planet. That methane detection was supported by ground-based observations from Earth. The discovery of methane on Mars is important because its primary means of production here on Earth is through biological processes. However, that doesn't mean herds of Martian cows grazing on the Red Planet's surface. See, methane can be produced by a range of geological processes as well. Still, its detection on Mars has raised eyebrows. And because methane can be destroyed quickly in the atmosphere, any detection of the molecule in the Martian atmosphere means it must have been released relatively recently, even if the methane itself was produced millions or billions of years ago and lay trapped in underground reservoirs until now. A handful of Martian methane spikes, along with Curiosity's reported seasonal variation from its location in Gale Crater, are raising exciting questions about how it's being generated and destroyed on Mars today. A strong methane signal measured by Curiosity on June 15, 2013, was also measured independently through observations by a spectrometer on board the Mars Express orbiter the next day as the spacecraft flew over Gale Crater. However, 10 further observations by Mars Express during the same period made no further methane detections. At the time of the Curiosity detection, it was speculated that the release likely occurred inside Gale Crater to the north of where the rover was. That's because the prevailing winds were blowing from that direction. However, the new Mars Express data suggests the methane probably originated from beyond the crater. That's been based on computer simulations using evaluations of geological features such as tectonic faults, seismic events, the expected expulsion of gas from small or dying seeps, the seasonal melting of permafrost, atmospheric circulation patterns, and the amount of methane actually being released over time. The authors also speculate that on Mars episodic gas expulsions could be created during meteorite impact, liberating gas trapped below the surface. The computer simulations allowed the authors to identify a location with tectonic faults that might extend below a region proposed to contain shallow ice. They say it's possible that the ice could trap subsurface methane and then release it episodically along the fault lines that break through the ice. The results support the idea that methane release on Mars might be characterized by small transient geological events rather than a consistently replenishing global supply. So, no real supporting evidence for the existence of Martian bovines, or for that matter, even the more likely bacterial activity. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. The United States says it wants American boots back on the lunar surface within five years. U.S. President Donald Trump has called for a spark of urgency to speed up NASA's plans to place U.S. astronauts on the moon by 2024 rather than the 2028 target date originally set by the Space Administration. This year marks half a century since man first walked on the moon, with the last Apollo moon mission leaving the lunar surface in 1972. However, plans to return people to the moon have encountered frustrating delays with the development of NASA's new heavy-lift rocket, the Space Launch System, or SLS. NASA and the SLS core stage prime contractor Boeing have been struggling with problems associated with the new giant rocket, which was supposed to be flying in 2017, but is now not expected to launch until sometime next year at the earliest. The problem is so concerning for the White House that U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has threatened to use commercial launch systems or look at other partners if NASA's not ready in time, saying it shouldn't take 11 years to get back. 
Now, Pence didn't mention SpaceX by name, but the inference was clear with a Hawthorne, California-based company already having their own heavy lift rocket, the Falcon Heavy, which was flight-proven more than a year ago. NASA's new SLS will be the biggest, the most powerful launch vehicle ever built, surpassing even the mighty Saturn V Apollo moon rocket. It'll be used to launch NASA's new Orion capsule, which is being developed to transport crew beyond Earth orbit to the moon and eventually Mars. The initial version of the SLS, known as the Block 1, uses a core stage equipped with four space shuttle-based RS-25 cryogenic liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled main engines and two strap-on five-segment solid rocket boosters based on the four-segment boosters used on the space shuttle. The Block 1 upper stage will use an interim cryogenic second stage currently deployed on the Delta 3 and Delta 4 launch vehicles. That uses a single liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled RL-10B2 engine. The Block 1, which will be used on the Exploration Mission 1 maiden test flight, will be capable of carrying 95 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 26 tonnes into a translunar orbit. And although it will be fitted with an Orion capsule, it will remain unmanned for the mission. An upgraded version, known as the Block 1B, will be used for Exploration Mission 2, which will be the first flight to actually carry people. Its current planning will see it used on a 9-day mission to the Moon and back. The 98.2 metre tall Block 1B will be different from the original Block 1 in that it will replace the interim cryogenic second stage with a new purpose-built exploration upper stage, or EUS, using four RL-10C3 liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled main engines. It will be designed to carry 105 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 37 tonnes into lunar transfer orbit. The final version of the SLS, known as the Block 2, isn't expected to be operational before 2029 on Exploration Mission 10. In its cargo configuration, the SLS Block 2 will be 111.3 metres tall and will use new upgraded solid rocket boosters, increasing payload capacity to 130 tonnes to low Earth orbit and 45 tonnes on deep space missions. Now, by comparison, the mighty three-stage Saturn V Apollo moon rocket was slightly shorter at 110.6 metres, but it could carry more into space launching 140 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 48.6 tonnes into lunar transfer orbit. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Russia has launched a new Progress cargo ship loaded with fresh supplies to the International Space Station. The Progress MS-11 blasted into orbit on a Soyuz 21A rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. Engine start command issue. Good ready to land. Engines up to flight speed. Good ready to land. Well, man, I'm here. Russia will come back to the air when they get to the And lift off. Lift off of the 72nd Progress Resupply Vehicle. Destination station, two orbits from now. Pitch, roll, and your program are in. 38 seconds into the flight, the International Space Station now flying directly over the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Soyuz booster passing through maximum dynamic pressure. Everything operating nominally. Good structural parameters reported from the uh, launch engineers in Baikonur. Roll pitch, all nominal, as we stand by for first stage separation. First stage separation is confirmed. The vehicle is stable. Second stage engine up and burning. This uh, will be uh, about 2 minutes and 39 seconds of second stage performance. Everything so far so good. Good roll pitch and yaw. Second stage engine reported to be operating normally. Progress docked with the space station's PS module just over three hours later, following a fast track to orbit rendezvous. The capsules carrying some 3.7 tons of food, supplies, equipment, and scientific experiments. It'll remain docked to the space station for about three months before departing in July and deorbiting in Earth's upper atmosphere, where it will burn up. The Progress's arrival marks the start of what will be a busy time for the Expedition 59 crew aboard the orbiting outpost, with two other cargo ships also about to arrive. Northrop Grumman's Antares rocket carrying a Cygnus cargo ship will launch mid-month from NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian mid-Atlantic coast. And around a week after that, a SpaceX Dragon cargo ship will fly aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. 
South Korea has successfully tested a locally developed liquid-fueled rocket engine. The Korea Aerospace Research Institute tests flew its KRE-075 vacuum engine on a second-stage test vehicle version of its new KSLV-2 rocket from the Nauru launch complex on the country's southern coast. Burning for 151 seconds, the new engine placed the test vehicle on a ballistic suborbital trajectory. The test flight reached an apogee of 209 kilometers some 319 seconds after liftoff, and eventually splashed down some 429 kilometers downrange in the East China Sea. The mission is the first to test fly the combined engine and KSLV-2 second stage systems, and follows more than 100 ground tests of the new motor. The three-stage KSLV-2 is being developed by South Korean engineers, following the country's first successful domestic satellite launch back in 2013. That 2013 launch of the Nauru-1 was a joint effort between South Korean and Russian engineers, the rocket being based around Russia's Angara launch vehicle's core stage. South Korea is now expected to test the full three-stage version of its KSLV-2 by 2021. Once operational, the new launch system is expected to place payloads up to 1.5 tons into low Earth orbit. South Korea already has a very advanced satellite development program focusing on military surveillance spacecraft. They are needed to monitor the activities of Seoul's aggressive neighbour, North Korea. Beijing has launched its 300th Long March rocket, sending a new telecommunications satellite into geostationary orbit. The ChinaSat-6 satellite was flown aboard a Long March 3B from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province. The 5,000-kilogram ChinaSat-6 will be positioned to cover China, Australia, New Zealand and the South Pacific. Being the 300th Long March series launch, it's worth having a look at the rocket series launch histories. And what it demonstrates is Beijing's rapid rise in spaceflight in recent years. For example, it took 37 years for the Long March rocket series to complete its first 100 launches. But it only took 7.5 years to complete its next 100 launches. And just 4 years to complete its last 100 launches. Looking at the data another way, it shows China's average number of launches per year increasing from 3.7 to 13.3 launches a year, and now almost 24 launches a year. A new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine has hit the newsstands, and this month's issue looks at the Saturnian moon Titan and what it can tell us about the origins of life. Joining us now with the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. G'day, Stuart. Uh, in this month's issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, we take a detailed look at Saturn's moon Titan and what we can learn from it about the likelihood of life existing elsewhere in the universe. You see, pretty much everything we know about Titan has only come about the last 15, 16 years or so. That's with the the advent of NASA's amazing Cassini mission, which got there in 2004, and it included a, a probe called Huygens from the European Space Agency, which landed in, I think it was January 2005. I'll Only never forget that amazing video of it actually descending to the surface. It's one of my favourite all-time videos. This probe that landed on Titan, it's the furthest landing in the solar yeah. system that anyone's ever made. It only lasted for about an hour, this spacecraft, because it was battery powered, so it wasn't going to last forever, and um, it had to send its signal back through the main Cassini mothercraft back to Earth. But gee, yeah, amazing pictures of the descent of the terrain and where it landed, and it took measurements, of course, through the atmosphere on its way down. So pretty much all we know about Titan, or well, the, the majority of what we know about Titan, has come from 13 years of Cassini, the mothercraft, circling Saturn and its moons time after time after time, and that one hour from the Huygens probe landing in 2005. It landed in what appears to be oily, wet sand. Oily, wet sand. Yeah, well, um, things are different on Titan. Let's put it that way. Titan's the second largest moon in the solar system. It's almost one and a half times bigger than our moon. And because it orbits Saturn, which is a long way from the sun, Titan's really, really cold. And it has wildly different sorts of chemistry going on on its surface and in its atmosphere, largely because it's cold and secondly because of the sort of chemicals that exist in the middle part of the solar system. So besides the Earth, Titan is the only world in the solar system to present to have a, a dense nitrogen atmosphere and it's also got an active hydrologic cycle. Now here on Earth, if you mention hydrologic cycle, you're talking about water. But on Titan, we're not talking water. The temperature there is minus 180 degrees Celsius. So water is like rock hard. That's the bedrock, ice. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like rock hard ice. Uh, I mean, you'd have to use explosives to blow it apart. Instead, on 
Titan, it's methane that plays a large role in the environment. At Titan's temperature, so here on Earth, the, the temperature on the surface of the Earth under our nice, lovely atmosphere is very near what's called what they call the triple point of water, where water can exist as a solid, liquid, and gas, depending on the, the actual environment where you are, whether it's the desert or the, or the poles. On Titan, the temperature there and the conditions there are near the triple point of methane, which means it can exist as a solid, liquid, and gas, depending on the local environment there. So on Titan, you've got you have a world of lakes and seas and rivers and rainstorms and sand dunes and things, all made of methane and similar sort of chemicals. So you can imagine that rivers of methane. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Now, while there's no serious suggestion that Titan has life, what scientists want to know is how far can chemistry go on a world before you actually get life? Right, so how far can chemical processes and evolution of, of chemistry go before you end up with life? That's why they're interested in Titan and other moons that have atmospheres so they can compare them with the Earth and then use them to make some educated guesses about what might be going on in the atmospheres of the planets and the moons that circle other stars beyond our solar system. Of course, there's still a big problem with all that, namely, what is the actual definition of life? What is the definition of life? Is, is a virus alive? You know? Yes. Uh, according to is fire alive? I mean, it Fire, all, yeah, depending yeah. on how you define uh, exactly. a life. A flame could be called alive, you know, it lives for a while and then dies. Or if it's a, if it it's reproduces got a vegetable... itself, it requires oxygen to survive. That's right, yeah, yeah. And we don't even know how life actually started on Earth, so it's a, it's a huge question. It is a big question, yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't know. We've got some good educated guesses on it, um, of how things go, but uh, this is well, why it's... We've been able to recreate it in the lab. No, no, we haven't, but we got pretty close, haven't we, uh, with the amino acids and things yeah. that they've... They've been able to, using just natural processes simulated in labs, they've been able to come up with the building blocks of life as we know it. And we know, in fact, that the building blocks of life, including amino acids, are just out there in space. They, they form naturally. So it's all very interesting. Uh, we're really at the beginning of this whole investigation of, of life. I mean, we've only known about DNA for decades, really, less than a century. So Thank it, you, it, Crick and Watson. Crick and Watson, yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much that we seem to... It's easy to forget how far we've come in less than 100 years in all kinds of sciences, whether it's astronomy or physics or, or biology or all sorts of things. We've come so far and we know a lot, but there's still so much we don't know because, really, it's still early days in, in finding out a lot of these things. Yeah, they say it's going to be... A, you, know, you watch... Uh, sci-fi programs like Star Trek and that, and that's set, what, two, four hundred years in the future, something like that. Uh, the way we're going, we're going to be in that universe a lot earlier. I think we will, yeah, yeah. Some things end up taking a lot longer than you think, and other things, they, they come along a lot quicker. Yes. Um, and, and the difference is in this day and age, too, compared to perhaps perhaps earlier days, I'm thinking aloud here, so maybe I'm wrong, but in this day and age, a lot of things are driven by... Um, by commerce and consumer demand, and and that that sort of uh, stimulates a lot of innovation. Whereas in the sort of golden age of science, it was just people working on their own, or in or in labs, or in universities, just doing pure research, just finding out about things. The thirst for no, knowledge. Yeah, just thirst knowledge. No real intent of Blue sky. What, what, what can we do with it. It's just finding out about magnetism and electricity and all these sort of things. So. A lot of those fundamentals, of course, we've known for a long time now, and they've all been settled. So it's uh, uh, it's a really interesting time now. So so some, well, I guess what I'm saying is a lot of things are moving a lot faster now than they would have in years past because um, there's there's more thirst for it, more more desire for innovation, and more desire to know than there was in early days. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study suggests dietary fibre may be a new tool in the prevention of progressive lung disease. The findings suggest the key could be in the production of anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acids. The research was detailed at the annual Lung Health and Respiratory Science Conference on the Gold Coast. It seems kids are more likely to be victims of bullying if they suffer depression, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, are risk takers, are overweight or are more intelligent than their peers. They're the findings of a new study trying to determine which factors make kids more likely to be victims of bullying. The study, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, looked at genetic data from 5,028 children. The researchers hope their findings will be useful in identifying key targets of bullies in order to initiate prevention programs. 
A new study has found that melting glaciers have contributed some 27 millimetres to average global sea level rise between 1961 and 2016. The new findings reported in the journal Nature suggest their contribution to sea level rise is far greater than previously reported. Using data from over 19,000 glaciers, including some in New Zealand, researchers calculated that in this decade alone, glaciers contributed an average 1 mm per year to sea level rise. This suggests that glaciers are contributing about the same amount to sea level rise as the Greenland ice sheet. Scientists warn that at the current rate, glaciers could almost disappear in some mountain ranges by 2100, including Central Europe, the United States and New Zealand. A new study has found that dolphin survival rates among the iconic population at Shark Bay in Western Australia has dropped by 12% since the 2011 ocean heatwave. The findings, reported in the journal Current Biology, also shows that the number of calves per female has also declined. The study looked at long-term demographic data from over 5,000 dolphin encounters in the area between 2007 and 2017. Researchers say the 2011 heatwave damaged seagrass meadows and fish communities and this loss of food may have directly impacted on the nutrition of young calves and may also have meant that dolphins are spending more time searching for food and less time watching out for predators. Well, it seems drinking a daily glass of wine for health reasons may not be all that healthy after all. A new study of over 400,000 people aged 18 to 85, reported in the journal Alcoholism, Clinical and Experimental Research, has found that consuming one to two drinks four or more times a week, an amount deemed healthy by current guidelines, actually increases your risk of premature death by 20% compared with drinking three times a week or less. Scientists found the increased risk of death was consistent across all age groups. Although some earlier studies have linked light drinking to improvements in cardiovascular health, the new study shows that those potential gains are outweighed by other risk factors, such as increased risks of cancer. The new study comes on the heels of research published in the journal Lancet, which reviewed data from more than 700 studies around the world and concluded that the safest level of alcoholic drinking is none. But that study looked at all types of drinking, from light alcohol consumption through to binge drinking. This new study focused on light drinkers, those who would consume only one or two drinks a day. Australian sceptics have welcomed the Victorian government's decision to ban the practice of gay conversion therapy. These church-based therapies have been denounced by the Australian Psychological Society, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, the Australian Medical Association and the Human Rights Commission. The Australian sceptics say it's reprehensible that every Australian state and territory still allows this unsubstantiated treatment despite evidence of abuse. The organisation's Tim Mendham says gay conversion therapies aren't based on any scientific evidence. They've been proven not to work and they've also been proven to cause physical and psychological harm. It's particularly big in America, this idea that you can convert someone physically from being gay. This is an issue in highly religious areas in which sort of gayness is is a sin, etc. And there's a whole lot of therapies that people are claiming they can use to un-gay people, including aversion therapy, which is like electrocuting the genitals, which is really sort of Pavlovian. Drugs to make people feel nauseous or vomit when they see gay pictures or gay thoughts. Exorcisms and prayer sessions. Pray the gay away. Yeah, yeah, pray the gay away, yeah. That's the mild version. So, I mean, you can imagine electrotherapy attached to your private parts. What do legitimate medical practitioners say about this? Uh, Rubbish. (laughs) It just doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And our problem with it is that up until recently, every state government, because it's a medical issue, state government responsibility, or federal government has never come out and sort of made this point that it's rubbish and they shouldn't be done. Except now, just recently, the Victorian government has. And they will say that they will ban it, this gay conversion therapy. And we applaud them for that. And we just hope that the rest of them will do it too, because there is absolutely no evidence that it works. It also just makes people feel worse about themselves to serious levels of depression, etc. So it has so a... That could be encouraging psychological and physical harm. I think almost definitely. Yeah, definitely it does, yes. And for no particular good reason, outside of a a religious indoctrination reason. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world 
on TuneIn Radio. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 